all the unnecessary junk troopers left behind. This week on the 11th OVC, we look at what the troopers were actually issued versus what they actually kept in the field on campaign. The standard complement of gear issued to the Federal Trooper during the American Civil War can be found in the Ordnance Manual of 1862 in addition to a few other places. Here it states that the full complement of gear issued to the Federal Trooper during the American Civil War was the following. One bridle, one watering bridle, one halter, one saddle, one pair of saddle bags, one saddle blanket, one surcingle, one pair of spurs, one curry comb, one horse brush, one picket pin, one lariat, and when especially required, one link strap and one nose bag. Additionally, the one saddle issued also included the tree itself, the skirts, the stirrups, the stirrup leathers with the fenders, the girth and the strap, of course, one surcingle, one crouper, and one carbine thimble. And when you add the standard issue personal gear like the sleeping blanket, the poncho or ground cloth, the shelter half, great coat, and when you add the haversack and canteen, which either would be on the horse, on the saddle, or on the trooper itself, it all ends up being quite the load for the horse and trooper alike. So the question is, what did the troopers actually carry and what did they discard with all the stuff they were issued? Just like in today's military, just because the military issues certain items doesn't mean the standard rank and file actually carries it in the field. Using our two more recent videos on the McClellan saddle, we discussed that the author of Lessons of a Decade state that the troopers quickly threw out their crouper and their saddlebags once they were on campaign and realized what was really important. So right there, we have already two things that we're already discarding according to the, uh, the Lessons of a Decade book from personal accounts and from letters that we've, that we've read as well. So what we're gonna do as we go through this video is uh, I've, I've actually saddled one of our older horses here on what I would consider a uh, campaign style event or a campaign style ride that we would go on with everything on there. And so what, if you looked at our previous videos before on how to pack everything, where to pack everything, I'll link that right here on the screen. Uh, but as you can see, we have our great coat, we have our uh, sleeping blanket and our, our gum blanket or our, our, our poncho here. Uh, we have our saddlebags, of course, with a comb and a brush and our watering bridle in there. Uh, we have our saddle blanket, obviously, underneath the saddle, but also underneath the saddle is the shelter half as well. Uh, you'll also see that we have our haversack, which is an optional item on the saddle, and, of course, our canteen on the saddle, which uh, wasn't recommended. In fact, actually, there's a regulation against, but they had to make a regulation halfway through the war because so many troopers were doing it. So, so obviously it was a normal or slightly usual thing out there. Additionally, of course, we have the curb bridle with the halter and the link strap as well. So in starting to take apart the uh, campaign load that I have on my horse right now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually uh, go through each item and uh, we'll end with what at least the uh, primary records say should be a trooper's campaign equipage. So let's go ahead and right now take off the crouper and the saddlebags. There's the crouper. And the saddlebags, and of course, we'll talk about what to do with what's in here, like the brushes and the watering bridle here in a little bit. But here's the, here's the saddlebags. Don't need those, apparently. Let's move on. Additionally, the author and many letters from troopers also state that they did away with the greatcoats as soon as it was even slightly warm in the spring coming into the summer. So again, let's take off the greatcoat because we don't need that during this time of the year. So again, don't need the greatcoat. So next, we actually have to do some digging on what was the next thing that was thrown out by troopers on a campaign style basis. Any guesses on what it is? Well, we'll see. First, the next thing I came to was how about the watering bit or the watering bridle? This awesomely unique piece of Civil War tack deserves its own video for sure, which we will do, but does it? Because was it kept with troopers in the field? So simply put, the standard issue item was not normally or usually carried by the standard rank of file as a whole. A great example of this is by randomly picking a unit and looking at the ratio of curb bits to actually watering bits throughout the entire war. I chose the 1st Ohio Cavalry since I've been doing some research on them already. Uh, and looking at the numbers throughout the entire war, there wasn't a single point in the entire war where even half of the troopers had or retained their, uh, their watering bit in the 1st Ohio Cavalry. 
So starting with the data we have in the last quarter of 1862, you can easily see that not once did the regiment have more than 40% of their troopers who retained the watering bridle. You can definitely see a resupply of the regiment during the winter of 63-64, but then only 38% of the regiment kept the watering bridle. So this is definitely out. So now the next item that we can likely throw away is of course, the picket pen. Uh, depending on the impression, this is a little bit more nuanced, a little bit more gray depending on year, unit, and location. But if you haven't watched our video on this uh, interesting piece of equipment, we mentioned, that in the, we mentioned in that video that the ratio of picket pens to lariats actually remains mainly equal up until about 1864, which means, again, from the lariat, which was very common throughout the entire war, and the picket pen, they kept both of these together up until about 1864. However, at that point in time, until the end of the war, the picket pins dropped dramatically, indicating they finally decided to drop this, at least what they perceived, unnecessary piece of heavy equipment. So, this is out. But, since it's spliced, or not spliced, it's actually fixed to the picket pin like it should, I'm going to have to unthread my lariat through it real quick. Alright, picket pin again, definitely out. However, definitely want to keep the lariat, so we'll just kind of wad this up for now. Stick it back in our nose bag, maybe. So next, let's talk about the nose bag. Just a quick reading of the 1862 Ordnance Manual states, again, that the nose bag was only to be issued as needed. Again, this is backed up by comments made by cavalry memoirs and, of course, lessons of a decade in addition to regimental histories. And finally, going through the ordnance returns, uh, the quarterly ordnance returns uh, from the National Archives, it is one of those things that I definitely like, I definitely want, and it was definitely common. I wouldn't say normal, I wouldn't say usual, but it wasn't the majority or say 51%. Uh, but I mean, those bags were obviously issued and used in the thousands. Uh, but if you're just looking at what was in the field, what was used, uh, you could argue that uh, it was only upon special request. So unfortunately, I love this nose bag because it serves as like the catch-all junk drawer of the saddle. Uh, but uh, honestly, according to lessons of a decade, that is out as well. Now moving back to the saddle itself, we've already expressed that the crouper was quickly thrown out, but extensive photographic evidence will also indicate that many troopers removed the fenders from the stirrup leathers itself. This is definitely part of the toggery that the author was talking about when he said that there's far too much leather on the saddle. So of course, these fenders are out. However, with the fenders, one thing that you must know and my, through my own personal experience is that once I've took, taken the fenders off, I've actually had my pants or my legs kind of pinched in, the, in between the stirrup leathers a little bit more frequently after I remove the fenders. So now, moving on to the trooper's personal gear, more than one regimental history, and of course the book that we're going through right now of lessons of a decade, make it a foregone conclusion that the experienced trooper put their sleeping blanket and their shelter half under the saddle. So now with the saddle blanket, and also interesting on the quarterly ordnance returns, is the obvious low percentage of official saddle blankets to saddles in the regiment. While still retaining an average of above 50% definitely, it was however common to see anywhere from 10 to even 30% of or 30% of troopers without a saddle blanket, but still with their saddle blanket. Thus, the use of a sleeping blanket served dual purposes. So, when you can put all this together, uh, it was, again, common to have that blue cavalry blanket in addition to the sleeping blanket, but there was still around 20 to 30% uh, of guys in each regiment who didn't have it. So, in the effort of actually making a kind of different or uniquely authentic experience, Let's take the saddle blanket off and replace it with our sleeping blanket. So I'll save the stir signal for a little bit longer, but this is basically what it is, throwing out your, your saddle blanket and using your sleeping blanket as your saddle blanket with the shelter half underneath. Let's continue on. So with this pile of gear thrown out, lost or commonly misplaced by troopers, this is what, at least according to the primary references and the regimental histories and of course the lessons of a decade, this is what a campaign saddle would have maybe looked like, or would it have been. 
So with all that said, and that list that we talked about, the last thing I want to talk about is the Sursinkle and how it may have commonly been used. Maybe not the majority or above 51% usage, but definitely something that you see in photographic evidence, and of course, lessons of a decade, the author who mentioned the use of a Sursinkle. If you remember, what he states is that a common use of the Sursinkle was as a breast strap or breast collar, because while the cavalry issued croupers, they did not issue breast straps for the 1859 set of cavalry equipment. So how they did this is they just went through the quarter straps to the front and buckled in on itself on the near side, or at least commonly what we can find in photographic evidence should be on that near side. So what we'll do is we'll actually take that search sinkle, go through the front quarter strap here. There we go. Come under. Back through the strap over here, goes back under through the front quarter strap. And then you'll see that pretty good. We can put the surcinkle on as a breast collar or breast strap. So what do you think about this list? Did we miss something or do you think we might be wrong in some of our assumptions or interpretation of some of the books, ordinance returns, or regimental histories? Either way, comment below on what you think from what we started out with to the end result of what a veteran campaigner might look like here. So with all that being said, what do you think about the list of what troopers threw out? Did we miss something? Do you think this is wrong? Or maybe some of our assumptions and interpretations of the data or the, uh, the literature might be wrong? Please comment below. Thanks again for watching. We hope this was valuable for you and hope you learned something about the American Civil War. And until we see you in the field again, ride hard.